Okay, as last we left off with the cannon project, the barrels had been turned to the point of actually doing the, uh, well, I don't even know what that, that particular end of it is called. This end here. These are the features that we're going to look to place on there. This is the best view of it. Now, in order to do these trunnion holes, I am actually going to skip over the end of this and I'm going to put what's what I call a disposable or a one-way feature on this part. Now, since this thing has to be indexed 180 degrees to get these trunnion holes in, you're going to need something to hang on to in order to do that. And so you don't have to put an indexer up on or an indexer chuck or a dividing head up on your machine and squeeze on a finished turn diameter. I'm going to face this off and we're going to take care of that in the bridge port with basically no indexing mechanism whatsoever, not even a plate. So stay tuned and let's see how we're going to do that. The two barrels that I need to put the trunnion supports on, or the trunnion features, are actually longer than the jaws of my chuck, well, my vise, will allow me to open. This opens to about seven and three quarter inches. So what I'm going to do is put a tall jaw in place of the standard stationary jaw on this one. And I am going to move to the rear of the vise and attach a new vise jaw to the back side. I don't know if, how many of you are aware what those holes are for, but they're put there for a reason and you can do whatever you want with them. This particular center hole, it appears to be the same as the other ones, but this is the one that controls the drag on the handle and the pressure on the little swivel that causes this jaw to pull down when you tighten it up. So don't mess with that center one if you don't have to. There's a set screw down in there if you've never seen it. Trust me, it's in there. And I'm going to secure this. And now we have as much opening as we want. You're going to like this one. Okay, you can see how the cannon barrel sits in here. Real nice. Everything is very secure. And because this end is extended, I'll do all my edge finding off of the front, which is one of the two reasons I left some of this material exposed. It is above center. These are job specific jaws. The part that I built these jaws for was a T and the leg of the T used to come through here. That's why I have the dam across the opening. That is a high speed steel parallel, 310 thick, works very well. This is an awesome opportunity to tell you how to indicate the center of a round part, tapered round part, not that it matters, in a mill. Let me get this uh, camera mounted to a tripod so we can secure this view right here. Get right back to you. In order to indicate a cylindrical object in the mill, whether it's tapered or straight, there are two required motions. One is up and down, and one is radial. You're going to look for the high spot in both ways. You're going to look for the high spot in the vertical, in the up and down, and you're going to look for the low spot in the radial. So let's go for the high spot in the quill first. I'm going to come down with the handle of the machine. I'm going to look for the high spot. Now it doesn't matter where the position of the indicator is because it's going to show a high spot anyway. As soon as that needle of the indicator crosses over the center line of the workpiece, it's going to start to drop back off. So you want to find that little sweet spot like right there. Lock the spindle down a little bit. Now rotate the spindle. See it goes down and cone, comes back up down comes back up. I'm going to back the table into this so I have the zero facing the camera and illustrate one more time. As it bounces you can see it moves but it bounces off the zero so that zero is a nice flat spot for you. It's not really a flat spot but it's the high spot. And when you go up and down, you can see it bounces off to zero as well. You look for the exact same reading on the other side. So now that we have a vertical zero and a radial zero, 
Well, let's move that back a little bit more. Take it to the other side of your part without bumping into anything. Make sure you don't overstroke the indicator. And watch for the zero on the other side as well. Now that chucks in the way a little bit, but I'm just going to leave it right where it is because this is uh, this is for me. Looking for the high spot. That's the high spot there. Coming back around. It appears that we're about seven and a half thou off. So the table has to come to me about seven and a half thou. I'm going to bring it back on this side to zero because that's a nice solid starting point. And I'm going to dial it towards me about seven and a half thou. Get her back to zero. Take it around the other side. Check it out. Should be pretty close. Okay, I hope you can see that. We got zero on that side. And let's bring it around this side and take a look as well. Zero, zero. And this is where you indicate the, uh, hit the digital, hit your dials, whatever you need to do to make sure you got zeros recorded everywhere. You're in. I've already made my offset on the y-axis, so the distance from the jaw is set back to the drop point. Now without any type of indexing mechanism on this, flipping this barrel over and finding this exact location on the other side could prove to be challenging. But since we have a lot of material in the back here, and the majority of this edge is going to go away, I'm going to take an end mill and I'm going to cut a flat across the end of this part. That flat will then be my 180 degree registration surface when I flip this over. I'll leave the table in the Y axis right where it is. That'll give me my center this way. And then I will just track the diameter one more time exactly the same way I did with this. I could set a stop out here and just run it back into the stop sitting on a parallel. But I want to be sure that those pins are in the exact same location without drilling all the way through the bore. Okay, so that's the trick for this one. This is what I call a disposable feature. When you put the flat on there and you invert the piece, you will have something to register your parallel on. It will give you a rotational horizontal reference to the feature that you just did. And later on, you either cut this off or turn it away and this disappears. That's a one-way feature. I'll show it to you after I mill it. The first side trunnion feature is in. It did not break through the bore. If you are going to plunge a counter bore with an end mill, a lot of end mills are not perfectly flat on the bottom. And it's going to leave you a conical base that will not be the full depth of the cutter because the, the cone will project up into the relief flutes of your cutter. Take a secondary cutter, go down in the counter bore. I don't know if you can see that or not. Take another cutter a little bit smaller than the one that you just plunged and knock the high spot off the bottom of the cutter. That way you get a fairly true seat when you push whatever you're going to push in there, in there. Now here's the one-way feature. I brought the end mill around the back and I put a flat on it. That flat will act as a registration surface when I flip it over. And naturally the flat is a little bit deeper than the parallel is wide so the part doesn't squeeze the parallel against whatever registration surface you decide to use. That notch is well away from the internal features here because I know I left enough material on there to do this. I did plan ahead. So that's basically how the notch will lay. 
inside. All right, let's flip it over. I'm not going to run down the entire machining of the other second side, but I will show you the setup when it's set up, so hang in there. Once I realized what height I needed on my parallel, I adjusted the height of my parallel. I have a one, two, three block spanning the ground sections of this vise. You can just barely see that air gap where the slot is not pinching the parallel. It's sitting square on it. And when I finish turning this barrel, that notch goes away and you can see why it's called the one-way part. It is not going back in this setup. It is not going back through the process. Well, at least not the same way that it uh, came through it on the first try. So that's a good trick, guys. Plan ahead. Leave yourself a little extra stock. Make any kind of registration or indexing feature that you may need. If you don't have an indexer or a dividing head or you don't feel like making a plate, put the feature right on the end of the part. Bank on it. Turn it off. Gone. That's all it takes. Next operation will be in the lathe. So come back for that one. Thanks.